Hello, Bill. Thank you for your time today. What are you doing, Coquette? What am I doing? Yes. Right now? I'm talking to someone from Germany. <laughs> in your lifetime. What am I doing in my lifetime? I am an investment banker with a Chicago firm called Jordan Off and Company. And we focus on middle market transactions. We define middle market as companies with revenues between $10 million US and $300 million US or earnings of a million plus, a million US dollars or, or more. We help companies. We, we help companies sell the company, part of the company, raise capital, or help them make acquisitions. You wrote the book M and A for Dummies. It's a bestseller book, and this is the best book on the topic M and A. Why you wrote this book? Somebody asked me to. <laughs> why? Why did you wrote, why wrote the book M and A for Dummies? What What was your motivation? Sure. Well, this, this is a great lesson for anybody watching this and how, how you can get things done. I did not ask to write the book. The publisher came to me okay. and said, would you like to write something? Now, why did they do that? I wrote a book a few years earlier on venture capital, early stage investing, things like that. And I wrote that book because I was upset. I had a business meeting that did not go well. And the chairman of a, of a company said, what the blank do you know about venture capital? And I was very upset and I didn't do a very good job explaining in the meeting. So I was very upset. So I wrote a book called Venture Capital 101. I wasn't planning to write a book. I thought it would just be some articles or I was just fleshing out some ideas in my head just for myself. And I ended up making a little story about it and uh, explaining a company from the initial idea through exit and all the funding rounds in between and had some fun writing it. And I called it Venture Capital 101. And I sent that out, didn't know what to do with it. Sent that out on the internet to a few people and it got yeah, sent around and it was kind of a viral, very, very minor viral hit, but it was a very interesting thing. And I kind of forgot about that, got into middle market investment banking. And then a few years later, somebody from Wiley Publishing called me or, or emailed me, I should say, that book, that venture capital book, ended up on their desk somehow, and they wanted somebody to write a book on LBOs for dummies as well. And I think they did that eventually. And I was intrigued by the idea of writing a book, but I thought LBOs for dummies, I said, who's going to read that? And they said, those, those guys on Wall Street that do those big deals. And I said, well, there's six of those guys, and they'll, they'll teach me more than I'll ever teach them. That doesn't make sense. And I started thinking, why not M&A for dummies? And they said, well, well Bill, who would read such a stupid book. And I said, I don't know, middle market business owners, much more bigger market. Uh, they, they, they're experts in running a business. They don't know much about selling a business. No, that's a bad idea. And two years later, Wiley came back to me and said, we have a new idea, M&A for dummies. Do you want to write it? And I said, that's a brilliant idea. How did you come up with it? And they said, well, you know, we, we have this office in Hoboken, New Jersey. We're much smarter than you. We came up with it. So anyway, I'm, I'm joking a little bit, not really that much, but that's, that's how that came together. So I wrote something uh, showed expertise, showed ability to get something done, and that opened up other doors for me. And it's a key thing. We talked about this offering something. I offered something. I didn't say I would do something. I didn't ask. I offered something. I demonstrated, and a door opened up for me. Yes, in chapter three, you speak about the 12 steps to buy a company. Why are these steps important, and what is the step one to buy a company? Well, buying a company and, and selling a company are two sides of the same coin. And the 12 steps I, I put in the book, I did that in part because it's kind of a tongue in cheek, the 12 step program, right? People who are trying to get over uh, some sort of issue. But when, when you look at the world of M&A, the, the world of M&A doing a deal, selling or buying a company really does have a certain step or a certain set of processes that you go through. And so if you want to buy a company, where that would start is the first step in, in that case, which is a little different than, than the 12 steps that you're talking about, which is more focused on the, on the process of selling. But if you wanted to buy a company, the first thing I would ask anybody, well, why do you want to buy a company? What's the purpose of owning a company? What do you want to do? Do you want to just own a company for a lifestyle and make a lot of money and have everybody else do all the other work? Well, that's not going to happen. Do you want to buy a company because you are passionate about that industry, that product or service? 
Is it a great addition maybe for a company you have already that puts you into a new market or helps you expand a, a, a new product into your market? What is the reason? What are you looking for? And then once you come up with those reasons uh, why you wanna make an acquisition, then I would do research and come up with a list of companies that meet that criteria, potentially meet that criteria, not only the product, uh, the, the type of product or service that is being offered, but also the size, the, the, the geography. Are you looking for companies just in the EU? Are you looking for companies in Asia? Are you looking for companies in America, et cetera, et cetera? Why do you think is it's, it's hard to find a business? Find a business to acquire? Yes, why, it, why it's difficult? Numerous reasons. It's a good, it's a good question. Numerous reasons. One, the number of buyers far outweighs, or far outnumbers the sellers. And in the United States, we've estimated somewhere around 7,000 private equity firms alone. And that ranges from traditional private equity funds that raise money and look to deploy by making acquisitions to uh, an individual or a couple people who know each other, some partners, and they want to buy a company to operate it. And they're looking to make acquisitions. Roughly 7,000 groups just on the financial buyer side. That doesn't even count the strategics who are looking to make acquisitions. So the amount of potential buyers far outnumbers sellers. And when you when you have a company, people don't list the company as you would list a piece of real estate if you wanted to sell your home and move someplace else. You go through a, a whole a different process. And I've, I've challenged you and I know you and I talked about this. Call up a business owner and just say, hi, I have money I wanna buy you and see what the reaction is. If you're lucky, they'll just hang up the phone. If you're not not uh, not so lucky, they, they might throw a few expletives your way because they get they get inundated with these offers. If you have a company and you decide to sell it, think about this, let's say you have, you go through a whole process and you have maybe five groups that make a bid and they're all good bids. Well, only one of those groups is going to win. So right there, you had five good bids. You can't sell that company five times. You can sell it only once. So four groups go home unhappy, only one wins that bid. It's, it's, it, it's a matter of supply and demand. The demand far exceeds the supply of companies. Yes, thank you. Do you have tips for how we can start a relationship with the owner, not like only take, like more giving to the owner, like how can I help you today? Sure. Yeah, if you want to be a business owner, uh, let me just, that's a great question. Let me just back up a little bit. My, my first challenge to anybody that wants to do it is why do you want to do it? What are you looking for? Much like anybody else looking to make an acquisition. Why do you want to own a company? Why are you excited about a particular industry? Do you have some knowledge? Do you have some experience? If you don't have any knowledge, if you don't have any experience about a certain industry, and you don't have any money and you just call up someone out of the blue and say, turn over your great company, sell it to me and I'll pay you later, you're, you're a stranger. What I would recommend is that somebody wants to make an acquisition, get amount, get a suitable amount of experience, become sophisticated in numerous matters, learn how to sell a product, learn how to read financial statements, learn how to deal with HR issues, hiring people, firing people, uh, deal with the bank, deal with environmental issues, understand real estate, uh, renting facilities and things like that. You need to have a full understanding of this. And the best way to do that is to actually do it. You can read about it. I think that's very important, but get involved, go work for business owners. So if you're interested, position yourself. First of all, figure out if a particular business and industry, an owner might have an issue, a legitimate issue or problem. And if you can position yourself as someone who has some unique insight or ability or experience that can help solve that problem, a real problem, that will put you in a position to join a company, to come on board in some capacity. And then you can start learning because now you are helping somebody, you're actually doing something of value. And as time goes by, you might get an opportunity to have a discussion with that business owner. What do you wanna do? What, what, what are your plans with the business? And that might put you in a position to make an acquisition with perhaps the help of the owner, because now you're known, the owner knows, knows you can operate this business and that owner would be potentially be willing to help you make an acquisition. Yes, it's a very different mindset to give than to take always. 
Yeah. Well, think about this. If somebody calls you up and says, I want, I want, I want, give this to me, give me all your time and do this for me, do that for me. They're asking, are you that interested? If somebody calls you up and says, I have tickets to the football match that you really wanted to go to tomorrow and they're free. Do you want the tickets? You're probably more apt to respond. Why? Yes, I would like to do that because someone is offering you something. And so in life, yes, at certain times you, you need to ask, of course, but as much as possible, if you can position what you're doing by offering something of legitimate and real value to the other side, you will find doors open so much faster when you are offering legitimate things as opposed to just asking. Yes, when we, when we, have, uh, when we have a company to buy, okay, how do we know what, how much we pay for a company? How we do the valuation? Well, the valuation is, is a great question, and that will depend on numerous factors. Ultimately, an asset is worth what somebody else will pay. And so you can do all kinds of calculations and say, oh, this, this company is worth 50 million euro, 40 million dollars, uh, 15 million pounds, what, whatever your, your, your money is. And that's great. You can say that, but let's just say it's a 50 million euro business and someone else looks at it and says, well, I'm not going to pay you 50. I'll pay you 30. And if that's the best offer you can get, that's what the market says. So that's a big part of how a valuation is created. And you got to remember valuation. It's just not the dollar amount. I think a lot of people focus around on the amount of euro or, or pound. It's just not a, a number. The, the valuation also factored in there is the timing of the payments. So if someone says, yes, I'll pay you 50 million euro for the business. I'll give you one euro right now and the other 49, 999 euro in 20 years. <laughs> you know, is that a good deal? There's a timing issue because you're not getting any of that money until much later. And so you have to look at that. You have to look at the representations and warranties that, that you as seller are making. Are they onerous? Are they reasonable? Or as a buyer, are you getting reasonable protections in terms of representations and warranties, non-competes from the, the seller? You don't want to sell, you don't want to buy a company, give that seller a lot of money, and then have the seller take that money, go right across the street and open up a business doing the exact same thing. So a lot of other factors go into business in a business acquisition beyond just what the amount of the sale price was. Um, okay, let's say we are personal and we don't have a lot of equity we we need to do go to the bank the banks are also doing a valuation valuation i think because they don't want to pay much for a company what's not uh, the money worth well like yeah. like uh, they they never pay over <laughs> they never pay well well yeah the the, the banks Banks are, uh, I, I don't know what the situation is in, in Europe. Uh, in the US, we have a lot of banks and they are desperate to put money to work. It's difficult for them to put money to work. And, and when I say that, finding a good business for them to put the, a well-run business with a good operator, a profitable, you know, growing business, all, all the things that you want, it's difficult. They, they really want to put money to work, but it is difficult to find Uh, good companies to uh, to to put that money to work. And now when I say put that money to work, that could be a bank providing some debt financing to help a buyer acquire a company. So you, you have some, it's like buying a, a piece of property, right? You have some equity and you borrow some money to be able to buy the asset. You can do the same thing with, with businesses. Um, you might, if once you have a business, especially if you have uh, assets in the business, you can lever those assets and, and take out a loan to help with cash flow or to help buy equipment. There's a lot of things that you can do that, that banks do become uh, very valuable, but they are going to be a bit risk adverse because they want to put money out. They want to get a return on it. And this might be a shock to you. They want their money back. <laughs> but I, don't know if it's, I, I don't know if it's different in Germany. No, it's not different. <laughs> But I think banks are not the only option to uh, buy a company. 
no, it's well, also like uh, maybe private equity people or I don't know firms. Sure. Well, there, yes, you, you have you have myriad factors. I mean, the the first way to do it friends. is well, well, sure, raise money from from friends and family. They're they're going to back you just because you're you. Okay. You can use a, a bank to borrow some money that might help make an acquisition. If you have enough money, if you have some money, maybe you have some investors, you found friends and family who like you and, and like the business, they're willing to become investors and become shareholders with you. Maybe you've got a little bit of money, your friends got some money, you can borrow some money from a bank. If you get enough money, you might be able to work a deal with, with an owner and say, here's how we're going to finance it. Here's the equity, here's the debt, and we would like a seller note from you. And this is how we'll pay you. We'll pay you interest on, on the money that you're extending us and, and, and we'll, we'll pay off that. Maybe we'll amortize that note over a certain period of time, like, like a home amortization, maybe a bubble. So we have a five-year, seven-year uh, time frame where we're paying interest and then we pay off the whole amount or refinance that whole amount at some point. And what you can tell a business owner is, look, you know, you're going to get a lot of money for this business. You're going, you're going to have to invest it diversify. We think that's a great idea and, and talk to somebody. Maybe you have a, a manager who helps you with that by stocks and bonds and real estate and all the other asset classes. But why not keep some of your money where you know it in this business? You're not keeping 100%, but you're keeping some of the money and you're going to get a nice return and you already know the business and you know us and, and you have confidence that we're going to operate the business well. So that becomes some, some options if you want to finance the business. It is true when you have a nice company that it's easy to find the money to buy the company when the deal is very nice. Yeah, you know, generally speaking, I mean, there, there's always exceptions, but the most difficult thing is simply finding a good company to buy. And if you have a good company to buy, and especially if you have, if the individual has suitable experience and background is a backable person. You know, if you've got a backable person or a team, a good team and a good company, yeah, finding the money, um, you know, and I don't want to say it's easy, but it's it should be easier than finding the company because finding a good company by that is the most difficult thing. You have a good company, a good team, you should be able to find money. There, there's other groups out there. There's other especially in the US, we have the big private equity firms, these big pools of money, and they're looking to deploy capital. We have a lot of other groups where they look like a private equity firm. Maybe it's maybe it's a guy or a guy and a, you know, a couple people, a couple partners, and they use their own money and they, they buy some companies and they've done well and they just buy things that they think are cool and that they like and they do well and that's great. And a lot of times they will look or be willing to back somebody who wants to make an acquisition. And so you can find those groups. Sometimes private equity firms will do that. They will back uh, another group by providing equity. Obviously, they're going to take an ownership position. So again, if you've got the experience, anybody, especially if you're a young person looking to make an acquisition or you want to be an entrepreneur, get the experience. Don't be in such a rush. Get the experience. Know what you're doing. And once you've got that, then try and figure out how to find, uh, uh, connect with the company and be able to put an offer together to acquire it. Yes, in Germany, it's uh, a lot of money is staying in the bank accounts, like for zero interest rates. And yeah, I think this money could be, could be better invested in companies. <laughs> well, that's that, that's always the the, the strategy um, when they have such a, a low interest rate environment. And that, that opens up a whole other can of worms, frankly. And and we talked about this. Or I sent you some notes in preparation for this, and that is replacement income. And that's one of the challenges. And frankly, it's a headwind for people making acquisitions where you are, let's say you're an older person. Okay, I've had a great run. I want to retire. I've got a nice business. I've worked hard. I've created a lot of value in this. I'm going to sell the business and, and turn the business over to someone else or another team and let them continue. And I wish them well. And what happens is you go through a process. You're going to incur costs with investment bankers like me you're going to pay a lawyer and you get done with the deal. And as we say in the U S and it's going to be similar in, in uh, Europe and Germany at the closing table, three people show up, you know, who those people are, the buyer, the seller and uncle Sam, because all that hard work, all that hard work and risk that you have taken, 
the government shows up and it's going to take a third or, or something like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so when you think about it, you do all that work and all that equity that you built up in that, that business, that value that you've struggled for, the government shows up and takes a big chunk. So now you're left with a smaller amount of money and you have to go live off of that. If you're an older person, you're not going long in the stock market. You need income. And guess what? In Europe, you've got negative interest rates. So you're not even able to get a, a decent income, just fixed income. It's difficult. It's difficult in the U.S. and it's a big problem for people on fixed incomes. And so that becomes a, a headwind. Well, why would I go through all that trouble, all that expense, give, give a big chunk of my money to the government and then make nothing on the business or, or, or put it in a bank account and actually be charged for having money in the bank account? I'll just keep the business and keep making a nice income from my business. So that becomes a headwind for people looking to make acquisitions. And guess what? That puts upward pressure on price. And so that makes the, that, that creates some inflation in the valuation of the businesses. Yes, thank you. Do you have three tips today what a people, I, a people can today do to start with the M&A process? Maybe start reading balance sheets or I don't know, reading books. <laughs> well, well, yes, the, the, the first thing you should do, and I, I implore all of the people watching this, is buy Mergers and Acquisitions for Dummies by Bill Snow. I, I would encourage everybody, buy five or 10,000 copies, give them out for Christmas and birthday gifts, and it, it's, you can use them as, as doorstops and paperweights. It's great. I, I would do that. I'm being, I'm being a bit facetious there. I apologize. But, <laughs> but the, if you want to buy a company, get experience. I mean, do as much reading as possible. Certainly, if you want to understand the basic steps of buying or selling the company, my book is, I think, a good starting point. It's a four dummies book, so it's not going to be a deep dive, but it's going to give you the basic steps. It's going to give you some of the terms and the nomenclature and and the the, the type of words that are used and, and so forth. So you become familiar, you become conversational with the process of buying a business. So I would do that and I would try it. it if you want to buy a business, if you don't know how to read financial statements, you are in trouble. So I would teach yourself that. What I would teach everybody is if you don't know how to do this already, look up some publicly traded companies, look up their balance sheet, look up their income statement, and just based off of those, you'll need a starting income statement, an ending income statement, starting balance sheet, ending balance sheet, but construct a cash flow statement from those two. Teach yourself to do that. And if you can't do that, you have no business trying to put a deal together to buy a company. So you need to be an expert in accounting because that is your foundation and learn how to sell, learn the difference between marketing and sales. And this is a great insight. Most people don't know this, so they can't explain this. Marketing is what you do to get a chance to make a sale. So understand the importance of marketing your business, understand the importance of how to sell the business, understand how to negotiate Okay, what's the biggest thing you've negotiated? So there's a lot of skill sets that are needed, I think, if you want to be a successful uh, business owner. You don't necessarily need all of those at the get-go because, believe me, you will learn. But the more skills that you can pick up before you try to become an entrepreneur, the better you will be, the, the greater the chance you'll have for success. Yes, Bill, thank you very much for the three tips. And thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you.